In this lecture, I'm going to discuss textures. A texture in Unreal Engine can be defined as a two-dimensional image used to provide values to a material input on a per pixel basis. So what do I mean by this? Well, so far, I've been using constants to define the material inputs. For example, I defined a yellow color to use as my base color, and it made my entire material that yellow color. I defined the value of zero for the roughness, and it made my entire material smooth. But what if I didn't want a uniform color or roughness? What if I wanted different parts of my material to be different colors or to have varying degrees of roughness? This is where textures come in. You can use a texture to define a different float value for each individual pixel. For example, if I go to the textures folder in the starter content, I can view all of the textures used by the materials in the starter content. This first texture is used to define the base color for a brick material. This one is used to define the roughness for that material. And this one is used to define the normal for the material, which we will learn about soon in an upcoming lecture. These textures use a naming convention in which the suffix indicates the texture's intended use. The letter D stands for diffuse map and is used to define the base color. The letter M stands for mask map, which could be used for various things, but for these textures is generally used to define the roughness. And then the letter N stands for normal map, which is used to define the normal. All right, so there are those textures available for you to use, but you can also use your own textures. For example, I have this image of the Unreal Engine logo. This image can be found in the textures folder of the course content under the name logotexture.tga. Okay, so if I go back to the editor and go to the content browser and click on the import button, I can import the image into my project. Another way to import is to just drag and drop it from its folder on the hard drive into the content browser. You can also drag and drop entire folders to import, which in fact I will do now. So I'm going to open the content browser and go to the content folder. And then in Windows, I'm going to open my course content folder and drag in the textures folder. This will automatically create a textures folder in the content browser and import all the image files within. Okay, so when you import an image, the editor will automatically convert it to a texture asset, which can then be used in the material editor. So all of these files here are now texture assets. But this asterisk indicates that they are all still unsaved. So I'm going to go up to File and then select Save All. All right, so now I'm going to go back up to the content folder and I'm going to create a new material. And I'm going to name it my logo material and then open it. Okay, so to use a texture asset in the material editor, you will need a texture sample node. To create a texture sample node, you can hold down the T key and left click in the graph. Then in the details panel, you can set the texture using the texture property. An even quicker way to do this is to select the texture in the content browser and drag and drop it into the graph. So I'm going to go to the textures folder and select the logo texture asset that we were just looking at and drag it into the graph. This will automatically create a texture sample node and assign the texture to it all in one step. You can even select multiple textures at once and drag and drop them, and it will create a texture sample node for each one. All right, so you'll notice that the texture sample node has several different output pins. Each pixel of a texture contains a value for the amount of red in that pixel, the amount of green, and the amount of blue. So the first output pin will output those three float values for each pixel. The next three output pins output just one of those float values for each pixel, either the values for the amount of red, the amount of green, or the amount of blue. Okay, so in addition to the three color channels, some image types also contain an alpha channel, which allows the image to save a value for the opacity of each pixel. If you import an image that contains this data, you can output these values in the texture through the A pin of the texture sample node. All right, and then this final pin will output all four of these values at once. 
All right, so I want to use this texture to define my base color, which takes values for red, green, and blue to make the final color. So I'm going to connect the RGB pin to the base color pin. So now, if we look at the preview in the viewport, we can see that it's using the colors of the texture to define the colors of the material. Okay, so using a texture to define the colors is pretty straightforward, but how do you use a texture with, say, the metallic input or the roughness input or any other input that only takes single float values? To help explain this, I'm going to hold down the 3 key and click in the graph to create a new Vector3 node and double click on it to open the color picker. So with the hue and saturation set to zero, I'm only going to use this value slider to adjust the color, which will only allow me to create black, white, or perfectly neutral grays. And I want you to notice what happens to the red, green, and blue values as this slider changes. First of all, notice that no matter what I set the slider to, each of the RGB values are always the same. So blacks, whites, and neutral grays always have the same amount of each of the individual colors in them, which is why they appear colorless. Secondly, notice that for pure black, this common value is zero. As the color lightens, this value increases until we get to pure white, which has a value of one. So the basic idea is that you can use textures made up of black, white, and gray pixels, and then use any one of the individual RGB channels as the output. The darker the pixel, the closer its value is to zero, and the lighter the pixel, the closer its value is to one. So if you connect the texture to say the roughness input, the darkest areas of the texture will be the smoothest areas of the material, and the lightest areas will be the roughest. If you connect a texture to the metallic input, the darkest areas will be the least metallic, and the lightest areas will be the most metallic, and so on. So for example, I have this image here, which is mostly white except for a black circle in the middle. This black circle is the same size as the circular area of my base color image. So I'm going to use this image as a texture for the roughness input so that the material will be smooth in the middle and rough elsewhere. This texture can be found under the name Logo Roughness Map. So I'm going to drag and drop it into the graph to create a texture sample node. And now, because we're using a colorless texture, the R, G, and B pins will all output the same values. So we can use any one of these pins as the output. And actually, we can use the RGB pin as well. Because when this is connected to an input that only expects single float values, it will just use the first value, in this case the red value, and ignore the other two. So in these cases, using the RGB pin is just the same as using the R pin. So I'm going to connect the RGB pin to the roughness pin of the material inputs node. So now, if you look at the material preview, you can see that the circular region of the material in the middle is very smooth, while the rest of the material is not. And this makes sense because the black pixels of the texture are outputting values of zero, while the white pixels are outputting values of one. All right, so I'm going to save this, and then to show you another example, I'm going to create a new material, and name it My Roughness Material, and then open it. And now I'm going to add a Vector3 node to the graph and connect that to the base color. And I'm just going to set the color to be green or something, just so that I start off with a uniform material. Okay, so now I have this texture here named Noise Texture, which has a variety of different grays in it. So I'm going to drag this into the graph. So right now, the roughness is uniform throughout the material. But if I connect this texture to the roughness pin, the roughness will be slightly different in places, giving the material a more natural look. Okay, so the way I've done this is the most common way to define a texture mapping for a single value input, where you create one texture for one input and output the data through the RGB pin or one of the individual pins.
but you may come across materials that combine data for multiple inputs in a single texture. For example, you might see a single texture being used to define both the base color and the roughness, where the RGB channels are used for the color and the alpha channel is used for the roughness. Or you might see a single texture being used for three or four different single value inputs where the red channel is used for, say, the metallic, the green channel is used for the roughness, and so on. But I recommend this method here of one texture per input. It's more straightforward and less confusing than the other methods, and you can see what each texture looks like in this preview window of the texture sample node. All right, so moving on, if you double click on a texture in the content browser, it will open that texture in the texture editor. So I'm going to double click on logo texture. And so the texture editor can be used to make slight modifications to your texture. So for example, you can make changes to the brightness, saturation, hue, etc. in the adjustments category. All right, but most of these other properties are somewhat advanced, so I'm not going to cover the texture editor in any kind of detail here. I mainly just wanted to show you that there is a quick and easy way to view a large version of the texture directly within Unreal. And also, I wanted to show you these buttons up here. You can use these buttons to view what the individual channels of the texture look like. So if you want to see what the red channel looks like, for instance, you just need to toggle off the other three channels. All right, so now I want to quickly talk about a specific property on the texture sample node, the sampler source property. This property sets how the engine will store and retrieve the texture used by the node. It's not important to go into detail about how this works. What is important to know, however, is that if all of your texture sample nodes have this property set to the default from texture asset, your material will be limited to only 16 textures. Going beyond this amount will cause the material to fail to render. The setting shared wrap, however, is more efficient and allows materials to use up to 128 textures. And Epic Games has said that when they developed this new setting, that the only reason it wasn't made the default was to preserve backwards compatibility with existing projects and not break them. So while you may not use more than 16 textures in a single material often, if you wanted to always set this property to shared wrap, there wouldn't be any drawbacks to doing so. All right, so now I'm going to close out the lecture by quickly talking about the resolution and file types of the images you, you use for your textures. So first, the dimensions of a texture image, meaning its height and width. Both of these values must be a power of two. A power of two means a number that can be created by taking the number two and raising it to some power. So for example, all of the following numbers are valid. Texture images are often square, such as 128 by 128 or 1024 by 1024, etc. However, they don't have to be, as long as both numbers are a power of two. An image that is 64 by 1024, for example, is perfectly valid. All right, so most graphics cards can't process resolutions over 8192 pixels or 8K, so 8192 by 8192 is the absolute largest you would ever want to make your textures, although in practice, you probably shouldn't ever go larger than 4096 by 4096 or 4K due to current hardware limitations. And of course, keep in mind that higher resolutions will result in better graphics, but has the trade-off of being more computationally expensive and thus can potentially slow down your game depending on the hardware it's being run on. All right, so when importing an image to use as a texture, Unreal Engine will support the following file types. However, in practice, there are only two of these you should ever be using when designing your own textures, and those are Photoshop, which has a PSD extension, and Targa, which has a TGA extension. The reason is that the ideal file type for a texture image is one that is both uncompressed and supports an alpha channel, and those are the only two file types from the list that satisfy both of those conditions. 
So the reason that you want to use an uncompressed image for your texture is that when you import an image into Unreal, it will compress it to the same format internally and thus the same file size, regardless of what the original file type was. So a huge Photoshop file will get converted to the same file size that a small JPEG will get converted to. So there's no memory savings by using a compressed file type like a JPEG. However, you will have a reduction in quality because of the compression. Okay, so then when it comes down to using either Photoshop or Targa files for your textures, the Photoshop format has one advantage, which is that it is the native format of its image editing software, and thus doesn't require the extra step of being exported first. You can just save and import. So basically, if you're using Photoshop to create a texture, you should just use the PSD format, otherwise you should export it as a Targa file. Alright, and that will conclude the lecture on textures.